this is this bit. But it's because the di- you weren't listening. The director was taking the mickey out of me. So rude. So rude. They I think it's his professional because he did he did a tiny bit of ITV last night. I mean, it's just. Oh like, really? Yeah, is that the sign of professionalism? Like, now he's got to work with the big boys. <laughs> he, can't, he can't cut the mustard. I this tell you what, let's go trouble. through the papers now, then, shall we, with Nicky Thompson and Ella Whelan? <laughs> Stop it. You who gets up and walks around the studio until the last second. It's broken toes. You don't broken know where you toes. are half the time. Driving mad. <laughs> Let's talk about Arch Remainers, Ella, in the mail. My favourite thing to talk about. Oh. Let's talk about Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, you know, we were talking about this inquiry and what it means for Johnson and what, what it might mean, what it might not mean. It is true that there is any time that Boris Johnson... Um, it makes any kind of headlines, it brings out Lord Heseltine and the rest of them to um, wish that this might be the end of Brexit. And he has been quoted in the mail talking about the fact that this, you know, he says, is a clarion call to begin the process of restoring our relationship oh, with Europe. Oh, Blah, blah, blah. Mm. Which, Ball you know, off. you might... Exactly. You can dis- I think you can probably dismiss Heseltine as something of a fantasist and a fanatic. But there is, a- around this particular issue of um, rejoining the European Union, but it is true, and I think this is probably something that a lot of people at home are thinking, that there has been a sentiment around, um, you know, a- a- quite a large sentiment within um, politicians and in the House of Parliament to entertain the notion of some form of rejoin, not rejoining wholesale, but tinkering around with maybe something to do with the single market, maybe something to do with trade. And that really feels like a sellout for people, as, not just for Brexiteers, but also for Remainers who have some sense of, um, dem- Remain voters who have some sense of democracy. So it's just to remind people that this is all, this hasn't gone away. This is always playing, you know, in the background. Of It'll go away eventually. Well, I mean, it's just like there was it's a democracy. It's whether, whether you supported it or not, there's been a democratic well, there's a, there's a decision. It's happened. Get over it now. If, if only. If only. <laughs> I don't ever <laughs> thought like you, Stephen, because they don't. That just drives me. No, because drives there's so many people who are standing up now saying, this just proves that Brexit hasn't worked. Yeah. It's still time to go back. Mm. Let's move on to killer heat waves instead. Scare ourselves to death with that. Yes, let's scare ourselves to death about this. Some uh, good news, bad news. I mean, obviously we know, I mean, it's just very obvious stories, but we know the country's getting hotter. And it's sort of saying that by um, 20, uh, no, the year 2100, sorry, I had to really read that twice. Uh, the average temperature we can expect in London will be 40, 41 degrees on quite a regular basis. And obviously we know past a certain point, obviously, you know, we get up to 30 quite easily now, 33, 35 sometimes. And then when you, once you go up into that upper echelon, things get really, really difficult for human life as much as for animals and kind of, you know, um, the microbiome and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, the, the sort of piece ends by saying, so, you know, lots of people will die because they're not prepared. Apart from this is quite a way away and we are talking about it, so... We'll adjust by then. We'll adjust. I mean, we'll, we have to. Change. We have to. The interesting thing is, obviously, you know, the, the, one of the reasons why it's so unbearable in London in the heat is because the way in which the buildings are designed, the yeah. fact that there's so much glass, you know, all the rest of it. And the, it, obviously we go to Mediterranean countries on holiday and it's much more bearable because the yeah. way it's designed. Mm. And I'm not quite saying that we need to tear down London and rebuild it, but there are ways in which, but hopefully by... Yeah, or the Middle East, where we people, can invent yeah, things completely. to bump, help well, mitigate the heat. I bumped into someone um, yesterday who's been working in Qatar and says it's regular, mm. it's, it's unbearable, mm. but it, it has been 60 degrees mm. yeah. out there. 60. Which is just astonishing, really, isn't it? Oh, like, it's astonishing, I mean, but they're not all dropping like flies. No, but then everything's aircon, so you just spend your life going from aircon to aircon, don't you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, you know, wine so. companies, um, vineyards in France, are now buying up hectares of land in Britain. Yeah. Because really? basically it's the same soil. Um, yeah. You know, you're, practically you know, close to each other at one point. It's the same land, and now the British land is moving into a, a climate zone which is agreeable to growing even champagne grapes. Yeah, well, English wine, Ken yeah. wine is absolutely beautiful. So, I mean, growing industry for us. Yeah, whole wow. new industry. <laughs> there you go. Can we have a look at um, Ella? Just Stop Oil, or Just Stopping Opera? Yes. You know, the thing you need to do um, to really convince the masses is to go to Glenbourne and uh, throw a hissy fit and pop off a confetti cannon. So they, you know, they, they seem to, climate activists, there's also a story out um, about from yesterday that climate activists in Sweden smeared red paint over a, um, a Monet, which is 
appalling act of vandalism. There's something they have. They have some kind of griff with the arts. They really want mm. to ruin all kind of artistic. Which is weird because they all seem to be posh. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And there's, you know, I don't. Maybe it's because Monet painted in oil. Monet painted in oil. Yes, possibly. Yeah. I wouldn't put it past them it being that crude. Um, but the, what happened in um, Glimbourn with this production is they, they actually popped the cannon off right next to the composer's ear, at uh, the uh, conductor's ear. So oh. he had to, which is terrible. So he dangerous. Had to take himself away and compose himself before he was able to carry on with the production. It was all very disruptive. And what does this do? You know, they say it's about getting the government to halt all new oil and gas um, production. What does this do to either change politicians' point of view, to change people's point of view? Actually, and it, certainly, hardens, it hardens us all against them, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, you don't have to be an opera fan to know that this is just childish behaviour. You yeah. just know that they just say, oh, what should we do, Tarquin, to, to, you know, to get people to notice? <laughs> oh, we need to disrupt Glenbourg. Well, they ruined the Chelsea I mean, Flower Show. They, they ruined a garden at the Chelsea Flower yes. Show. I love the Chelsea Flower Show. It's like, it was my... a sustainable and garden. I'm not, it was a sustainable garden. And they said, oh, because, you know, if you can't eat it, you shouldn't plant it. What nonsense! That's uh, not how the environment works. They just want us to... I mean, really, it is the most anti-human, misanthropic kind of we all should just live these miserable, tiny <laughs> lives doing nothing nice and there'll be no art and we won't eat anything. We'll all just, like, cold gruel. Go away. Yeah. <laughs> no, fair enough. Um, Nikki, let's have some positive news yes. in the Telegraph um, about cancer and this new blood test. Yeah, so a new blood test has been devised. It's already been trialled in America that can potentially find um, uh, up to 50 cancers, and it's literally just from a blood test. Either a doctor gives you one, a, like a local GP service, or they're actually even talking about rolling out a home blood test service where you'd prick your finger and you'd send, um, send it off to get the results. Uh, it's transformative. The reason it's here, actually, is because of what we did during COVID, because of home testing. So it's mm. changed people's perceptions about how they treat themselves at home. Really, really excellent news. Apparently, it will completely ch change cancer diagnosis. Yeah, they'll, they'll, be they'll, be able to, they'll be able to detect cancer before there are any symptoms. Yes, exactly. And things like pancreatic cancer, brain tumours, which are often quite severe, uh, quite late on and you can't treat them, they will be able to, you know, they'll be able to get an early warning for them. So it, it is a really good news story for the NHS, actually. Yeah, no, it's, fant it's fantastic news. I think there's, you know, there's, we, I remember talking on this show before about the balance between some of this stuff makes you feel a bit cynical and you think, well, why aren't people being treated in hospital, What, particularly for older people? Mm. The likelihood of someone doing their own blood test prick when they're, I don't know, 82 is, or you know, or even uh, younger is, you know, there's a kind of generational element that might be a barrier to this. On the other hand, there is making things like this more normal. So actually, de yeah. taking the sting and the fear out of mm. the blood test, of getting it into your own home, and making it this sort of a, a bit like a urine test, something that you just sort of do and bring to the GP or drop off whatever, could really change people's approach to cancer. Because I mean, as you know, the, so much of the um, reason why people don't go in because they are almost in denial. They're yeah. afraid of yeah. the C word. They Absolutely. don't want to face it. And so they're making any of these tests or screenings more accessible. And, and eventually, if, if that really does work, the earlier you can detect it, the cheaper the treatment will be as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. So it has Absolutely. a knock-on effect throughout the whole of the health yeah. service. It's great. I mean, they did it with HIV testing, and that's been very successful. Mm. So, I mean... Yeah, they, do they do bowel cancer screening yep. now by, with home test kits. Yeah. Um, and lots of things are being done, and it, it does mean that earlier detection will mean, uh, obviously, a better outcome for all, but cheaper for the NHS. Yeah, it's oh, a win-win. Yeah. yeah, it is yeah. a, it is a win-win. Yeah, it is. Uh, what's a lose-lose, both of you on this? Um, Greenwich Council banning <laughs> ice cream vans. <laughs> Oh, honestly, it was I mean, a what? it's a consultation to decide whether to ban them on certain roads in Greenwich. If you've driven through Greenwich, it's always a nightmare. It's completely locked. But that's for lots of different reasons. It's not the ice cream vans that are blocking it. I love an ice cream van. I have one on my street. I can't wait for my daughter to be able to eat solid food so I can take her for her first lick of an ice cream. I'm very sentimental about them. They were important to me in Yorkshire as a kid. We didn't have much money, but you could always go get an ice cream. Yeah, so just leave those, them alone. It's one of those childhood joys you always remember. Yeah, yeah the sound coming the down the yeah. road and you'd... I remember Remember, we'd everybody would run out of our flats, and you'd go and yeah, it, would, it would be a social ha kind of a thing. Have yeah. you had a 99 lately? Because yeah. there's still all this hoo-ha over the flakes. 
Why? What about them? Well, the flakes, they're not, they're all crumbling. We did a story on it a few weeks ago, and then later on that day, I went and got one outside B&Q, those an ice cream van. I said, let's go and get an ice cream. I said, how are you getting on with your flakes? And he got the box out. It was like that. And they're all, you know, there's a real job to, to get us. Oh. Yeah. Because the ones you get in the 99 are much tinier flakes than a flake. Oh, yeah, they're half the yeah, size. Yeah, more compact. Mm. Half the size, but they're all falling to bits, so Cadbury's need to sort that out. Oh. Definitely. They're still Cadbury's, are they still made by Cadbury's? Yeah, yeah, Cadbury's yeah. flakes. Yeah, but I mean the ones that the ice cream Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, good. Oh, yeah, but they're all <laughs> falling to, fall to pieces, which is, <laughs> which is no good at all. Screwball was mine. Yeah. Oh, oh, I saw a screwball. I used to like an oyster. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Remember, you could get an oyster as well from the same sort of ice cream van. Very nice. An oyster, have, no. Yeah, it would be a, um, a, fl a, um, a, a wafer, a wafer <laughs> yeah. oyster shape, and then you'd have a bit of marshmallow in it, and then a, a load of ice cream yeah. as well. Yeah. <gasps> an oyster was wonderful. Oh, does he still make them, I wonder? I, I do. Probably. They do. 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 They